James chapter 1 this morning, if you would. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. When you found your place, if you're able, let's stand together as we read the scriptures. James chapter 1. Verse number one, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now, I desire to be an encouragement and a blessing this morning. That's my prayer. So when I give you the title of the message, you might think, oh, pastor, that's not very encouraging. But I want you to give me a hearing this morning. I want to draw your attention to verse number two, because this is where the message is. It says this, my brethren, count it all joy. Now, what's the next three words? What was it? When ye fall. When ye fall. So we're going to look at that this morning. Like I said, it will be an encouragement. It will help you. It will bless your heart. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity again to open the Word of God and read the Scriptures. We thank you for the power that's in the Word. Lord, we pray as the children's Sunday school goes on that you would give uh, Robert and Carly wisdom as they teach the children. We pray, God, that you would bless them, speak to their hearts and encourage them about our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, we pray. And then for us as adults, as we're in here this morning now, I pray, Father, for all the cares of the world that may be bombarding our hearts and minds, that we would just get rid of those. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would arrest our attention that we may give our full attention to what you have to say to us this morning. We do pray that you would bless our hearts and encourage us and help us, we ask. Fill each and every one of us from the pulpit to the pew with the power of the Holy Ghost that we may hear what you have to say to us today and we will be mindful to give you all the praise and all the glory for it's in Jesus' name that we ask this. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Can you remember way, way back when you were a child, and for some of you here it might be a lot harder for others, but I can still remember when I was a little child that one of the things that we were taught when we were out playing and if we would fall over, we were always encouraged to get back up again. All right. Now when our kids were little, and we've got parents here and kids are little when they're starting or learning how to walk, and as they start off they would stumble, they would trip, and they would fall, wouldn't they? And we never rebuked or chided or scolded our kids when they were learning how to walk and they would fall over. What would we do? We'd say, okay, come on, up you get, and we would encourage them to stand up, uh, get a grip of something, steady yourself, now come on, let's start walking, and we would encourage our kids after that they had fallen to get back up again and to keep walking. And if we didn't do that, then it's probable that they would never get up and walk, they would be lazy, they'd want to be picked up all the time and carried around, but as parents would say, no, 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 we're not doing that, I'm not going to be forever carrying you. Can you imagine if at 19 I was still carrying Robert around? I mean, it would be like, my goodness, I would have a sore back, I would be in hospital myself. But we would encourage and teach our kids when they would fall over to get back up again, keep walking again, get running again, and uh, let's get back into it. Now, we do that in life, and we see it also in sport. How many times have we watched the Olympics or a track and field event where we've seen the runner, he's giving it all he's got, and he trips and he falls? What does he do? Unless he's busted his leg, he gets back up, and he keeps running again. He doesn't stay there. And uh, I remember watching a, uh, a Special Olympics, and I think it was kids, and uh, there was Down syndrome and all sorts of kids there that were uh, mentally challenged and so forth, and they would be running. And one kid fell over, and all of them stopped, went back to this one child that fell over, lifted her up, and they all ran and crossed the line together. 
How good would that be in the Christian life if we had someone in our midst, a brother or sister in Christ, that when they fell, instead of kicking them while they were down, we went around them, lifted them up, and we encouraged them to get back into the race again, get back walking in, because we, let, we would say to them, hey, let's cross the finishing line together. How many of you would remember perhaps when you were learning to ride a bike or your child is learning to ride a bike and they were riding with trainer wheels and the first time you take the trainer wheels off and off they would go, they would be wobbling all over the place and more often than not they would stack their bike, they would fall over, they would cry, they'd hurt their knee or whatever. You'd come along, you'd brush them off and you'd say, come on, let's get back up again, get back on the bike, let's keep riding. We encourage them to do that. I was fortunate enough as a young man to uh, grow up around horses. I had horses of my own. and Ab, uh, huh? You had one too? Yeah. Yeah, I had a horse. I had three of them. You fall off. So yeah. Yeah, thank you. That's my message. Preach it, sister. <laughs> you know, we were taught if that if you fell off the horse, you get back on again. Why? Because if you don't get back on the bike or if you don't get back on the horse, you would be afraid and you may never get back up and get on again. And that's exactly what Satan wants. Now, in our, in our text, we see here that James is writing to people that have been scattered abroad. I personally believe, this is just me now, I personally believe that the book of James and Peter, because Peter's also writing to people that have been scattered, they're writing to the people that in Acts chapter 8, when Saul made havoc and wreaked havoc among the churches, that all of the church at Jerusalem, they scattered except for the apostles who stayed at Jerusalem. And the apostles, I believe, like Peter and James and John and all those other guys, especially James and Peter here, wrote these books to encourage the brethren that have been scattered abroad because they're, they're living in places they're not sure of. They're out of their comfort zone. They don't know the language. They don't know the customs. They've gone all over the place. And James and Peter, because Peter also mentions in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, he also mentions the temptations that come upon us. He also mentions the trial of our faith. And uh, he also mentions uh, 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 about praying and believing and all these sorts of things. And these epistles, James and Peter, are written to not just those people back then that have been scattered abroad, but how many of us understand this morning that there are brothers and sisters in Christ that are scattered all over this planet, they're scattered abroad, and these books are not just books written to Jews, they are books that are written to every born-again child of God to encourage them to, when you fall, let's get back up again. Amen. James here says this, he says... Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse or various temptations. Why would James write that? I believe the temptations, and I know it's in the plural, but one of the temptations that you and I will face because we are scattered abroad, this world is not our home, is it? No, it's not. Heaven's our home. We've been scattered abroad. One of the temptations that you and I face when we're in a foreign place when we're out of our comfort zone, when God is using us in areas that we may not like or be used to, do you know one of the temptations that we face is the temptation to quit? Temptation to give up. The temptation to not take a stand against the things that are going on today. So James says, when you fall into various temptations, he says, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Solomon said this in Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 9. He says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe unto him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Now, you may not have someone around you physically to help you up when you fall. But you've got God who never leaves you or forsakes you. You've got the Holy Ghost who lives in you and empowers you and helps you. You know, how many times have we left the house and really never given acknowledgement to God? Never given acknowledgement to Him. And we've left the house and we've gone out, gone about our daily duties and uh, sometimes we wonder, why has all this befallen me? What's going on here? Why is this happening? Because sometimes we just... 
go about our duties without even acknowledging God in the morning, not even acknowledging the Holy Spirit, not even asking Him to fill us and lead us and guide us, not even uh, submitting ourselves to Him and saying, God, use me today, empower me today, help me today, and, uh, and off we go. And sometimes we do fall into various temptations because we've never asked God to help us throughout the day. It was interesting when Brother Dodd was teaching this morning that he went to Matthew and Jesus said this. He says, pray that ye enter not into temptation. How many of us, including this preacher, how many of us on a regular occurrence say, Lord, I'm asking you that I will not fall into temptation today. I'll be honest with you. It's really not on my prayer list. Maybe one of the reasons why I fall into temptations is because I've not prayed and said, Lord, I don't want to fall into temptation today. So we've got God with us. Now, how good is it, though, for brethren, as we're walking together, as we're running together, as we're living the Christian life together, as we're serving God together, and we see a brother or sister fall. Now, I'm not talking about just falling into sin, because temptation is not the sin. So many Christians think that because I'm being tempted, I must be wicked or I'm in sin. No, the temptation, and by the way, we'll have a look at it in a minute, God is not the one who tempts us. But the temptation is there to, not only for you to fall into temptation, but you through the temptation to fall into sin. But the temptation is not the sin. But how good is it as Christians if we fell into temptations and we're struggling and we're striving and, and, and we've fallen? How good is it for a brother or sister to come along and say, hey, come on, let's get up and let's go together? Because more often than not, when we see a brother or sister that's struggling or they've fallen into some whatever it is, it could be a sin or it's a temptation, they're having a hard time. We look at that and say, wow, God must be judging them. What did that brother or sister do? And what we do is we take on the judge role instead of Jesus being the righteous judge and we judge the brother or we judge the sister instead of getting alongside of that individual and say, let me lift you up, let me help you and let's go together. Let's walk together. Proverbs says this in Proverbs 24, 16, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again. But the wicked shall fall into mischief. We're really going to focus on this one verse. And I've got three things that I want to give you this morning. And the first thing is this. And I want you to understand this. Nobody plans to fall. Nobody plans to fall. No, you didn't get up this morning and you think, well, I'm going to fall today. Did you? No. No. Nobody plans to fall, but often in life when we step out of the door and we're going about our daily duties and we're walking and whatever, we stumble, we trip and we fall. But we don't plan to fall. And quite often Christians, when they do fall into temptations or they fall into sin, they, they, just, they, they condemn themselves, they give them such a hard time. But if truth be known, none of us plan to fall. Last week I mentioned my mother-in-law. She was a blessing. And she was all of four foot nothing. I think she's about five foot. This is where Tracy gets her great stature from. <laughs> she gets it from her mum. And my mother-in-law was quite she was a she was a dumpling of a person. She was a she was a lovely lady and she had short legs and, and she wouldn't when she would walk, I, I I was trying to think how I could show it to you but I probably wouldn't give it justice but when she it was it was sort of a walk in a trot you know what I mean because it, because it was short legs if you if you'd ever go walking with it it wouldn't be like you know striding and things like that it would be like you know just because she's small it's like quick steps you know we were sitting in the lounge one time I don't know if Tracy remembers this we were sitting in the lounge one time and the taxi pulled up the front and our mum her mum my mother-in-law got out and she had a couple of bags of groceries and and we're sitting there and we're watching her. Well, you know, she wasn't overloaded, so I was just watching her come down the, <laughs> watching her come down the walkway. And she's got these two bags of groceries and she starts. And all of a sudden, bang, down she went. The legs went up. And all I could see from the front was his legs going up in the air. And she's come down and she got herself back up again and dusted herself off. And she went on her way, come into the house. Now, when she got out of the car, she never planned to fall. 
But she tripped over a leaf or something. I don't know. She's always tripping over the smallest little things. But none of you, when you got up today, none of you, when you get up tomorrow, none of you would plan to fall. But it says when you fall. When you fall, you are to count it all joy. When you go walking or running, or I, I, I've got back into walking again. I sort of let it lapse for a little bit, but I've got back into walking again. And I walk from my house to where Robert works, which is at the Stockland Shopping Centre, it's about a 6k walk. And uh, off I would go. And I don't walk slowly. I, I just I get right into it and I walk. But I never plan to fall when I go walking. It just doesn't enter my mind that when I'm going to go for my walk, I'm going to stumble, I'm going to trip, I'm going to fall, I'm going to hurt myself. It never enters into my mind. I never plan to fall. I plan to go from A to B. But sometimes when we're going from A to B, we stumble and fall. Unfortunately, the pain of falling has stopped many Christians in their walk for the Lord. How many of you have actually fallen before, physically fallen? You've been walking or you've been running or you've been doing something and you've fallen over. Anyone fallen over or have I just been the only one that's ever fallen over? Most of us have fallen over sometime in our life. And how, how many of you hurt yourself when you've fallen over? Anyone hurt yourself when you've fallen over? There's a pain associated when you fall. And many Christians, when they fall, even if it's into temptations, the pain of falling stops them from getting up again. And you can't allow the pain of falling stop you from getting up and continuing the walk or continuing the race. Because the temptation is to quit. We heard this morning in the adult Sunday school about the problems and struggles and strife and, and what did you call it? The natural tendencies or the... The natural instinct would be to do this or to do that. And do you know when we fall and hurt ourselves, the natural instinct, the, the general thing that we do is we just want to stay there and not get back up. I'm hurting my knee, my hip. And for some of you older folk that have had operations on your knees, you have to be very careful because it's hard, isn't it, to, to get back walking again. You've got to be careful that you don't trip and stumble and fall. And if Shay were to fall in her house after having a knee operation, it would be very hard for her to get back up again. Number one, because she's on her own. And number two, because of the pain that would be associated with falling because of a, of a knee operation. But spiritually speaking, too many Christians don't get back up and get back into the race when they fall and they quit. They stop. Well, let's not be that type of Christian. Secondly, I want you to think about this. When we fall, we fall when something is placed in our path. We don't see it. And what James is talking about and what Peter is talking about, let's go over to the book of 1 Peter for a minute and I'll show you what, what Peter said. James talks about, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. And we'll go back to James again because James picks it up later on in, uh, in, in chapter 1 when he talks about enduring temptations. In chapter 2 he talks about faith because this is the thing, that when you fall into various temptations and you perhaps hurt yourself or you fall into sin... Quite often, if you don't get back up again because you think, well, I'm so unworthy, I'm so this, I'm so that, I've fallen into the sin. God can't use me anymore. You stop racing and fear enters into your life instead of faith to pick you up and get walking again. So James talks about faith. James talks about prayer in chapter 5. He talks about the power of prayer and we ought to be praying one for another. But look at what Peter says here. Look at chapter 1, verse number 1, 1 Peter. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout. Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia. And he goes on, look at verse number 6. When ye great, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So he's talking about the heaviness of the manifold temptations. I'm going through life. There's temptations everywhere. I'm tempted to quit. I'm tempted to fall into sin. I'm tempted with this. I'm tempted with that. And sometimes we think, God, I can't handle all of this. He says, hang on a second. It's the trying of your faith. James says patience, 
Put patience to work. Let patience have a perfect work. Look at verse number 13. He says this, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Where do most people quit first? In the mind. Look at verse number 17. He says about passing the time of your sojourning here in fear. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I'm going to say it anyway, because James says, count it all joy. And I'm wondering... In what way can we count a joy? Look at what Peter says. He says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. And he's saying, listen, you're falling into temptations as a trial of your faith. Gird up the loins of your mind. Listen, you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You were redeemed by the precious blood of the lamb. You're a saint. You're a, you're, you're a child of God. He said, these, these things ought to encourage you and stir joy in you because I've been born again by the blood of the lamb. I've been washed in my sins. Now look at verse 21. He says this, who by him do believe in God and raised him up from the dead and Give him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. He say, man, you guys are scattered abroad. You're going to have all these temptations. It's the trial of your faith. Gird up the loins of your mind. Don't be afraid. You've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And he says this, you have hope in the might and power of God. How many through sickness and even perhaps the Gadeens or the Masters that have been going through some things or perhaps you're here this morning And you've been going through uh, days or even weeks of stuff in your life and you think it's unbearable and how can I continue on? And you have been tempted time and time again just to throw up your arms and say, God, I quit. Why bother? I'm just going to stay down and lay down. I'm not going to get back up and get back in the race again. Well, you know what Peter says? Peter says, you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Peter says, you gird up the loins of your mind. Peter says this, you should have faith and hope in God. God can help you. God can lift you up. Go to uh, 2 Peter, please. 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll get back to James in a minute. Let's see what Peter says here. How, How many of you, when you fall into various or diverse temptations, how many of you, the first thing that you do is run to the Scriptures? More often than not, we focus on the temptation or we focus on falling or we focus on this, but very rarely do we run to the thing that can help us the most. Peter says, this is first, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called you to glory and virtue. That is a message there in and of itself. The power of Almighty God has given you and I all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Now look at this, through the knowledge of him. Can I encourage you with something? You need to get to know him better. Because the more that you know Jesus, the more that you're going to understand the things that his power has given you in this life, that you may live this life, and that you may not just live this life, but a godly life. And then he says this, verse 4, whereby given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. There's the promises. How many of you run to the promises of God when you fall? Very few. Why? Because Satan is so good at getting you to focus on falling into the temptation and falling into sin that he will tell you that it's, you're no good to claim those promises. What right do you have to claim the promises of God? Look what you did. You fell into temptation. You fell into sin or whatever it might be. But Peter goes on and he talks about adding to our faith all right, virtue, knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and charity. Now look at verse number 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh, now watch this, he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see. How many times do we fall because we're blind and cannot see? Right, We cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was once purged from his old sins. Man, it's done. It's done. 
The, the sin transaction's been done. The blood of Jesus has been shed. You've been saved. Wherefore, look at verse 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, what's the next phrase? You shall never fall. Wow. Nobody plans to fall. You don't have to fall. Because if you remember that you've been purged from your sins, and if you remember the promises of God, and if you remember who you are in Christ, and if you add to your faith all those things. Now listen, Christian life's a hard thing, folks. Salvation is free, but it costs. It, it, it's work for the Christian life. You just can't sit here and get teaching or preaching on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and then that's it. You've got to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You've got to be in the Word. You've got to be adding to your faith. You've got to be working on your salvation. You, you've got to make your calling and election sure, because if you do these things, you shall never fall. Amen. You don't have to fall. But we fall when something is placed in our path and we're blind and we can't see it far off. When I go walking, I do two things when I walk, because it's a 6K walk. When I walk, I look ahead and see how far I've got, and I've got stages that I walk. I, 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 I see where I'm going, and then I look down, and I just focus on the path that I'm on. Because you know what? I don't want to fall. So I look up, yep, that's where I'm going, and then I look down. And I'm watching around me to make sure that I don't fall. And then I look up, oh yep, I'm going in the right way, this is where I'm going. And uh, I'm walking, I'm walking, and then I look up, oh, there's a bike rider coming, oh, I better get out of the way. And I'm walking, and I'm looking down, then I look up, oh, there's someone walking their dog, I better get out of the way. Because if I don't look up, if I don't see where I'm going, and I run into that person, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to fall. So nobody plans to fall, but when we fall, when something's placed in our path. Now, we're talking about temptations. Have a look at 1 Corinthians 10 for a minute. 1 Corinthians 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. Again, I'll get ahead of myself. This, is, this verse is a reason that we can count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations. Look at verse number 13. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Count all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations. God, I didn't plan to fall today. I know that. I knew, God knows, I knew you would fall, but there's no temptation taken you such a common to man. Back in James, God, James says this, God doesn't tempt any man with evil. So if God is not the tempter, who is given the name the tempter? Satan. So Satan tempts you to fall. The temptations, he tempts you to fall and he wants you to fall in sin. But he cannot use something that is not uncommon to man. He has to use things that are common. Because if God allowed him to use uncommon things, that's unfair. <laughs> but God says this, there's no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You all have common things in your life and I have common things in my life that Satan can use as a temptation for me to fall into the temptation and then, James says, the temptation leads to sin. But God will not allow or suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able. So this morning, if you're under, like Peter says, I'm under I'm, I'm heaviness through manifold temptations... All these things are coming against me. I'm facing all these things. You need to stop for a second and say, God, you must be, you must be allowing this into my life and you obviously think I can handle this. Because you will not allow me to be tempted above that which I'm able. God will not give you something that you are not able to handle. But not only will he not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able, but he will make a way of escape. How good is that? 
Here's the escape route. We've got it above the door. That, there's the guy running. If you look above the door there, there's the sign. The guy's running. That's the escape route. So God says, I've made a way for you to escape. Are you looking for the escape route? Because God doesn't want you to go from temptation and then from temptation into sin. That's why he says, if you do these things, ye shall never fall. That's a promise. That's a promise. Let's go back to the book of James. James chapter 1 again. Look at, uh, look at verse number 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now, death came into the world through sin, didn't it? But did Adam and Eve die physically? Not at the start. But they were separated from God. So sin separates us. If we fall into sin, we, we, we don't lose our salvation. We don't lose... Our kinship, we're still sons and daughters of God, but the sin has separated us from fellowship. When, my, when our kids were little and they did wrong, I didn't go about giving them good things and rewarding them for their wrongdoing. The, the, the relationship was still there, but the sin had separated You've got to get that right. There's that discipline. You, you better pray about this. You need to, when you apologise, then we can do some business here. All right? Same deal with God. The reason why God doesn't want us to fall into sin is because He doesn't want us to be separated. Not lose the salvation, but there's that fellowship that's been separated. I don't want to be separated from the fellowship of God, I don't want to be separated from the life of God. The power of God. The blessings of God. Do you? No, I bet you don't. Now, James, in verse number 2, says, Count it all joy. And here's the third thing. Let the power of joy pick you up. Let the power of joy pick you up. How many need to pick me up? <laughs> I need to pick me up. I need to pick me up. The world's pick me up, right? When, when, when worldly people, when unsafe people are down in the dumps and they need to pick me up, they turn to the bottle. Yeah. They, yeah. <laughs> she doesn't even know yet. They turn to the bottle, they turn to drugs. Their pick me up helps them to escape the reality of what they're experiencing. But for the Christian, the Christian pick-me-up is the joy that picks us up to deal with the reality of what we're suffering. Did you get that? Joy gives you the ability to deal with the reality of what you're suffering. Brush yourself off. Woo! Glory. Let's get back into the race again. Hallelujah, God. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, glory to God. Just shake it off and get excited and get back in the race again. Why do we count it all joy? Because Jesus suffered being tempted. And you are never more Christ-like than when you're being tempted, when you're suffering being tempted. All of us like to be mountaintop Christians, like we heard this morning up on the mountaintop where Peter, James and John saw the transfiguring of Christ and they beheld his majesty. Wow. But you are never more Christ-like than when you are suffering in temptation. That's why you count it joy, because Jesus, if it's good enough for you, it's good enough for me. Because who do we think we are 
if we think we can get by life without suffering the temptations. So when you fall, you count it all joy because it's like, well, praise the Lord. I want to thank you, Lord, because now I, I, I'm, I'm experiencing exactly what you experienced. I, too, am suffering being tempted. Do you get that? It's hard rejoicing or counting it all joy when you're going through different things, isn't it? Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 2 says this, Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. I like on a Sunday morning, we had Michael and Anita and the boys stay with us last night and good to have them with us. We, they're good friends of ours. They're more than friends, they're family. I mean, they're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ, but we've known each other for a long time. And what I do in the morning, I have my time in my office, which is my shed, and then I, I go on my computer and I go to Victory Baptist Church because I love their music. It's real upbeat Southern Gospel music. And they recently had a, a week of camp meeting, and I like camp meeting stuff because it's a lot of Yahoo, and I, like, I don't mind a bit of Yahoo every now and again. So what I do is I put that on and I play their music. It's upbeat, it's... It's stuff that you can rejoice in and get excited about. And I, I, don't, I don't, because you know, Sunday mornings, I don't know if you experience this, it could be a Saturday for you, but Sunday mornings is a morning where the temptations are there. The temptation not to go. Right? The temptation to stay home. The temptation to, oh man, I'm just so tired. Or for a preacher, you get the text messages. <laughs> Pastor Anyway we won't go into that So I either have to not look at my phone Or I count it all joy and say You know what Lord If, if Satan is tempting me to be a sour puss And get discouraged and, and, and not even get excited about church If that's going to happen Then Lord I count it all joy I rejoice I thank you but I like to, I like to, I, I call the sort of music that I listen to. You know, anyone watch Rocky? Anyone like watch Rocky? You ever Eye of the Tiger? <laughs> Sorry, I know it's so calm when I say it, but that southern gospel flavour of music is my Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> I listen to it, and it's like, yeah, Ooh, glory to God, and I just praise the Lord, and I just like listening to it, and it just, it gets me in the spirit that I want to get in. You're looking at me like, what? I often only listen to the church. Oh, okay, that's all right. Three of them. Three of them. I just listened to one and that's it. <laughs> all right. But I want, to, I want to experience the joy because I want to endure. You see, count it all joy when you fall. Why? Because joy is your pick you up. It helps pick you up. Nehemiah 8.10 The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Remember what Jesus said? We looked at it last Sunday morning out of Sunday school. He answers our prayer. He says that my joy might be in you. The joy of the Lord is your strength. How many of you are relying on the joy of the Lord? If the joy of the Lord could endure the cross... Right? Because he was looking at what he was looking past the cross and he was seeing the blessing behind the cross. How many of us ought to rejoice in his joy, looking past the temptations and the suffering and seeing the blessing after it? But many of us see the situation, many of us get wrapped up in the, in, in the problem, in the trials, in the stresses, in the temptation. Oh, I've fallen into sin. Listen, confess your sin, ask Him to forgive you of your sin, and get back up and get in the race. Don't stay down. That's where Satan wants you, he wants you down. I want two more scriptures. Would you go to Isaiah 61, please? Isaiah 61. In Isaiah 61 verse 1, it's also in Luke 4, 18. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. 
He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. That's us, folks. The prison doors were open. We were in bondage and now we've been set free. Someone say hallelujah. I mean, glory to God. We've been set free. We are no longer prisoners. We are no longer in bondage. Now look at verse number three. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. Look at this. The oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. The oil of joy. Oil is a picture of the Holy Ghost. The, the joy of the Holy Ghost. Get into the Spirit. <laughs> I mean, get into it, folks. Don't let terminologies of certain movements out there rob you of a blessing. Man, get into Spirit. Get into joy. Stir it up. Don't let Satan keep you down. When you fall, the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Do you know what the garment does? I mean, you think about it. When you put on a garment, it covers. I mean, now you can't see my fine physique. But it covers, doesn't it? So what's the garment of praise going to cover? It's going to cover... The spirit of heaviness. I don't want people to see a heavy spirit. I want them to see a garment of praise. How many Christians come to church with a spirit of heaviness and leave the garment of praise in the car? Yeah, that's right. Now, listen, out of the mouth of babes, I'll take any praise. I'll take any, I'll take any hallelujah. Man, you ought to go to your spiritual wardrobe. You're in a spirit of heaviness. You've got mourning. You've been facing the multitude of temptations and you're struggling and we all are there. But you open your spiritual wardrobe. Get out the oil and anoint yourself with the oil of joy. Grab that garment of praise and stick that thing on and go to church with a joyful heart and a praising heart. Or go through your day rejoicing and praising in the Lord. Second Peter chapter two. Let's go back to the New Testament. Man, we're counting it all joy. God, I'm experiencing temptation, and I'm rejoicing, Lord, because you suffered being tempted. Man, I am rejoicing because because I am to have the joy of the Lord, which is my strength, and, and I'm rejoicing because uh, the, because of your joy, you endured the cross, you despised the shame, you knew the blessing that was before you, you knew what was going to happen through the cross, and I know that through this heaviness and through this temptation, I'm going to be more Christ-like, but joy is going to pick me up, the oil of joy, the garment of praise. Now look what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 9. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. <laughs> Are you suffering being tempted? You know why you count it joy? Because the Lord knows how to deliver you out of temptation. And by the way, look at the context of this. Look at verse number 7. And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation. How did he deliver Lot? He sent the angels and said, follow me. And off he went. You want to be a Lot or Lot's wife? We all know Lot's wife. She turned and became what? Pillar of salt. Yeah. The Lord knows how to deliver you out of temptation. That's a way of escape. Look, we heard it, the glimpse of Jesus. Look to the Lord. Look to the Lord. I am rejoicing. Why? Because I am facing various temptations. Temptation to sin, temptation to quit, temptation with this, temptation with that. I'm facing all of this. But he says, I'm to count it all joy. Why? Jesus suffered being tempted. His joy helped him endure the cross. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Your joy is my pick-me-up. The oil of joy, the garment of praise. And you know what, Lord? You know how to deliver me out of temptation. But 
But the reason why we look down the spiritual road and we see so many Christians that have fallen and still laying there where they've fallen is because they don't have anyone to pick them up. They've not got to the place that even if they had no brother or sister to pick them up, they've not got to the place where in maturity we go to the scriptures and we say, Lord, help me. What's going on? Oh, God, you know how to deliver me out of temptation. Oh, Lord, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that. Because it's through the life of the scriptures that's going to give you encouragement and it's going to give you strength. And we ought to be running to the scriptures, not running away from it. When you fall. Now, I'm glad I don't have to. That's what Peter said. I'm glad I don't have to. But I have. I don't want to. Nobody plans it. Right? Nobody plans to fall. We fall because something's placed in our way and we don't see it. So if we fall, let joy be your pick-me-up. And keep on the walk, keep on the race. And keep praising the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for the word of God. We ask, Lord, that you would strengthen us and help us. Lord, for those that are here this morning that are facing the manifold temptations, the, the diverse temptations, the struggles of life that we all experience, God, I pray that through the message, the Holy Spirit has been able to have an opportunity to strengthen and to remind and to encourage and to revive and to excite. And, and I pray that people have been picked up. And Lord, that when we leave here, we'll get back into our walk with you. We get back into running our race. God, we've dusted ourselves off. We've put on that garment of praise. We've anointed ourselves with the oil of joy. We've remembered what you've done. We, we're, we're bought with the blood of the Lamb. And may we be excited because of who we are in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we just want to say thank you and we love you and we praise your precious name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.